Today, I'm in Cherokee, North Carolina at the O'Connell Lufty Indian Village, a living history village where Cherokee life comes to life. That's coming up next. Go ahead. We'll start off with Chio, Damami, Jacquardo, Galiania, Honey, Pizzi, Luki. Please, hello. My name is Dylan, and we're glad you're here. On the tour, as you see, you can see you can have your cell phones where you're, you're uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my morning started here. <laughs> you can feel free to take any pictures or videos you like. Just please silence your cell phone. There will be crafts in here from the elders. I will show you some of these crafts, and you can, you know, pass them around if you like. But please be respectful and keep your hands off some of the crafts in here from them. And if you guys would like, follow me and we'll start. Okay, and have you here, we have our finger weaving station. And typically, as you see, these ladies are using commercial yarn. Before we use that, before we get commercial yarn, we'd use the mulberry root fiber, or just the mountain hemp plant. And along with that, we'd also use the mountain bison. Now there is three different types of weaves that they do. I'll start off with the third one, since this was going to be one of the examples. It's an oblique weave, as she's working on over here. She incorporates beads into the design so it gives it more fashion. You guys can pass these around if you like, feel this. And then the first one that they'd like to do is just single weave. It's your simple over and under, but I like to braid your hair. You'd simply get a checkered pattern out of it. Or you could also get like a pad, plaid pattern out of it. You could also do a double weave, just giving it more intricate designs and patterns into it. And then typically out of time, these ladies, depending on their design, can work up from 10 to 200 different strands at a time. This would be an example of the width of a 200 strand. Typically they'd sew these together, make them as like blankets or shawls they'd use. It's a flax thread, metal needle, like thing you find today. And before that, we'd also like to use our she shells. We trade those along with the coastal tribes. We'd also use a corn bead. It's typically grown by like a corn stalk plant. It grows about a foot, foot and a half tall. If these individually fall off and there will be little thistles on the inside, you can just pull the thistles right out and it leaves a natural hole right through the middle to use. And along with that, we use clay beads out of pottery. When we was introduced to glass, we'd also use glass beads as we'd shave down by hand. And typically before that, like I mentioned over there, we use the mountain hemp plant for the fiber. They'd also take a deer hoof, use the shin of it, they would dry it, crack it, and sh shave it down. And once they'd shave it down, it'd get into a needle shape, and that's what they do. And typically they do two, two different types of work. One would be a scroll work. This would be something typically you'd find. You'd uh, put them down to men's leggings, or they'd border the women's skirt. And the second one they would do, it would be a solid work. It's more of a belt something you could trade, you know, buy, sell, you know, so you'd use them to wear them. And simply what they do, would, they would take an individual bead, sew it into the previous bead that was previously there. Therefore, the, you know, the yarn goes through multiple times, making it more strong, more durable. If it was to break, very few beads would fall off of this, and it'd be very easy to repair. Just pass it around if you like, feel the weight of them. And typically on that, they can use anywhere from about 1,500 to over 2,000 beads on one of those. And here you have our pottery station. And typically what you do back in the day, you go to a river bank or a creek, you dig about a foot, a foot and a half below the topsoil. It's not typically like red red, red mud you find today or clay. And generally they would do two different types of methods. And one would be a ball method. And they just generally roll that into a ball to their hand. They would take it with their thumbs, putting their thumbs on the inside, and pressing and working their way on out until they get their desired size. And the second one they would do would be a coil method. And simply all it is, just a flat disc of clay. And they would take individual coils and roll them up and just keep stacking them on top until they get their desired height and width. And as you see, this one's darker compared to the last one. But typically they would take a softer wood. And in the firing process, use a softer wood. It would burn with more smoke. More smoke would wrap around, giving it a darker color to it. They'd also just use a harder wood. It would burn a whole lot harder and it would give it a whole, give it a lighter color. 
And as you see, there's patterns on them. And typically, they would just use like wooden tools. They'd also come along with paddles with designs in would carve out, used for patterns. They'd use she shells. They'd also use corn cobs. You use about anything typically they find to put a design into it. Then back to the corn cob along with the firing process at the same time. They would crush these down. They'd fill the inside of the bowls up, up with them. And during the firing process, oils would release out of the corn cob, making the bowl waterproof on the inside. Here you have our wood carving section. And as you see here, we like to make a lot of masks. They use us for ceremonial reasons. And what we used to make before masks, we'd use a, just a tree bark. It's a whole lot softer. Using sharp, like uh, carve them out of flint knives. To make it a whole lot easier, we'd also use just garden doors. We'd cut them off to make a mask out of them. We also tried to reuse everything we could, so the back of the mask that we'd use from the gourds, we'd cut them out and make bowls. And then once we finally got introduced to metal tools, like I said, our masks, they got a whole lot more redefined. We could actually use the hardwood and hollow out the insides. Make them, like I said, we can make more different designs and patterns out of them. And then, like I said, back with the gourd, we never tried to waste them. So what we'd use, we'd use them and take them, use them as like a water dipper for like ceremonial purposes. We'd also make them put beads in there, make rattles out of them. And then once we was able to get metal tools, we'd get able to take one piece of hardwood, shave them all the way down hollow out the inside, put beads and rattles in there again. They'd also use a deer hoof and water and you'd crush those together and it'd make like a natural glue you'd stick the top back onto. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Then like I said, before our metal tools come along, this would be our typical garden hoe you'd find. Just a rhododendron handle, as you see all grown around here. Just a piece of flint tied on with animal sinew and that's all we'd use for a garden hoe. That's what we'd use before the metal come along. We'd be able to hammer ours out and make our own. And then, like as you see, what I'm wearing, they would take the like extra metals that was no use to us or going bad. They'd either cut them down, make them into armbands. They'd use these to wear them as like kind of like bling, more jewelry to use. And also, these be made as like war trophies, something as you take from your enemy when you went to battle, you'd bring it back. And pretty much, the more bling you had on, the more attention you'd get from the ladies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we say still that way today. <laughs> Open up, bling. That's all it is. We took it, I mean, we took it also as a, about from nature, I like male birds are usually naturally more colored and brighter than the, like the women, you know, said to give more attention, <laughs> gotta try harder. <laughs> <laughs> so then before our metal tools and everything come along, this would be something you guys can pass around if you'd like. That is a bison horn. They'd hollow those out, make them for like a ladle or a spoon. They'd also use a mountain cane, and as you see, we just put two prongs on them and use it as a fork. That's something we would use. And of course, when the settlers come along, we figured out their utensils made it a whole lot easier, so we tend to just copy those. And then as you see in our mask, they had eyes. And then this rock over here for an example. This is something we'd use back in the day to help that along. It'd be a bow drill. And typically all of this, piece of flint tied onto the end of that would send you. About as simple as you could change out a drill bit today on a tool. This would be simply made out of stone, give it more weight and counterbalance to it. And simply you'd wind it up. Hmm, made a little bit of elbow grease and hard work and you get some words with it. So I'd like to say that'd been your first black and decker. <laughs> Even along with the wood carving, they figured out they'd find soapstone, a lot softer stone they could carve out of. 
as you see, it has bird feathers on it. And as I mentioned, they had seven different clans. That's what they make the mask for. And typically, this would be made just for the bird clan. It would be used only by them in ceremonies and just for them. This would be another soft stone that they use. They would use this along in the council house. And you guys will learn a whole lot more about that in the council house down here. And along with the seven clans of how it made up. And as you see, there's seven different sides to this. So to be one member from each clan, come along, place their stem in here. And pretty much it would represent, you know, everybody's together here as a whole. We're pretty much ready to start. And then also these right here. These will be, I'll explain a little bit more down here at the next section, but these will be basket handles. And typically they'd get the wood carvers to come up here and carve these out for them and shape them. These are an interlocking handle, as you see here at the bottom. They just interlock together to hold each other in place. This is our basket weaving station. And typically, before we use our white oak or our river cane, we used to use our uh, hickory bark for our baskets. This would be an example of one that was here about in the 40s and the 50s that was made when the village first opened here. I mean, it's still here today. It's still adorable. This has been another example of our flint knives that we used to use. We simply shape them down, have a handle on them. I seen you want to make a knife out of them. As you see, as they got the splints laid out here, all they would do is take the river cane and they would split it. And as they keep splitting it down, as you see, it gets smaller in size. These does start to get a little bit more smoother for them. But generally, there's still always the joint on the end of them. And to get those smooth, you typically just take this piece of leather as it's laying here, they lay it right on his knee, take our knife. Just simply lay it on there, add pressure, and just pull it to shave them back. Mm. And just keep doing that process to get them as smooth and the you know, width and the size of the light. Kind of like as you see in his basket right here, and also in these, they got colored into them. And simply all they would do is take a uh, walnut and they use it for a dye, make it make it brown. Use a butternut, <laughs> make black. Mm. They'd have a yellow root. You'd make a yellow. And then they'd also have a blood root. Depending on how long they dyed it in the process, they can make like an orange or a red out of it. And as you see here, just as different colors of how the dyes would come out. I forgot, I, f I failed to mention it, but if you guys can see it, Drew back there, he has a big drum back there. He is actually boiling and dying some as we speak. That's where these come from. Yeah, he typically left them in there for about a week and a half, two weeks, depending on how dark he wanted to get them. As he told me, he didn't think he got them dark enough, so I guess he should have left them a little bit longer if he wanted to. And generally, they make two different types of baskets. One's just your single, single weed basket. And this is where the handle comes along from back up there. As you see at the bottom, it starts and interlocks at the bottom. And simply all they do is weave the basket around the handle pretty much. Hmm. This will be made generally for weight carrying, more carry along stuff, more sturdy. But once they figured out if the handle started to break, or if the basket started to come undone, they would generally have to unweave the whole basket, put a brand new handle back in there, and pretty much weave a brand new basket back together. And then they figured out to make that a whole lot simpler on them, they made drop handle baskets. Which generally, as I like to say, this would have been your Louis Vuitton handbags back in the day. That's what the women would carry, you know, more, more style to them. And simply all they do is just make a hook, and all they have to do is pinch these together, just slim them right down on the rim, and just weave the top rim of the basket, and then your handles are repaired. Like I said, made it a whole lot simpler in the process and easier to fix. And then the second type of basket that they do is he's working on an example of one right here. It's a double weave basket. And as you see, these are smaller, tighter weaved. And they start with the shiny side on the inside. He weaves the way up. And as soon as he gets to the rim, he pinch it over at the rim, fold it down, and weave down the back side of it. And as you see, that'll turn out into a doubled layer, doubled weave. And generally, if he can get this tight enough on the first go around, it could be waterproof to him. But if not, they would just take beeswax, rub the beeswax all on the inside of that, and make it waterproof. And he's on the process right there. As you see, he's got the bottom side. He made it to the rim, and he's folding over it, and now he's weaving his way back down. And on the way back down, he's added his colors into it and designs. And here you have our weaponry section. And as you see, 
generally these men like here make spears with arrowheads. They also use them for bows and arrows. And typically, as you see him doing here, he would use a piece of flint or obsidian, <coughs> kind of like a volcanic glass. And he would generally just take a smooth, rounded river rock, pretty much fray the edges up of them until they'd get to his desired shape. And once they got into the shape that he would like, generally he would take a deer horn, one ear on the end, he would lay it down and pressure flake the edges of them. And you guys can see these right here. That'll just give the more de defined shape to them, give them more point and sharp to them. Come along, they made these with bow and arrows. They made the bow out of a yellow locust, really strong, durable wood. The string would be generally made out of a bear intestines. They take it and dry it out. Sometimes they bleed together to give them more strength. And then typically, they'd have about 70 to 90 pound draw on them. I like generally send one of these arrows but across the football field. I felt like that was pretty good for figuring that out back in the day. And then just like they was using the river cane for the baskets, they would use a mountain cane. It's typically generally the same thing, just grown in higher elevations. It's a whole lot smaller and lighter. The fins for them would be just made out of turkey feathers. As you see, there's two different arrowheads they put on here. They put a round shoulder <laughs> arrowhead on here. That'd be for typically your hunting game and animal. It'd be something you could easily retrieve it out of. And they'd leave the pointier edges on here, kind of like, like your fish hook. That'd be made for your enemy. You usually go to shoot that in your enemy, it would enter in them. The blood would get on the sinew, the sinew would get loose, and they'd go to pull it out, and the arrowhead would either stay inside, or they'd have to push it straight on through, or cut it out. So if they didn't try to kill you with the first shot, they killed you with infection down the later, or tried to leave you with a pretty bad day. It's just simply, the river cane again also. They made these for our blow guns. As you see, there's one right here, straightened and ready. And generally, they got some more over here drying out. And as they dry, as you can see, they are not straight whatsoever. So they just take it, roll it over fire, to get it pretty warm and hot. They take it, and where it's kinked, they roll it along their shins just to get it straightened out. And generally, they would do that again with one more. They would make a smaller arrowhead for the end of it. They would, as there's joints along the way, kind of like a bamboo has, they would stick this up pretty much knock the joints out along the way and once they finally got those knocked out and hollowed out he'd pull it back and put river sand into it. And he'd take the same stick, flop it, pretty much run that back and forth and use that sand as a natural like sandpaper and he'd hollow the insides of them out. And then along with the bow, our darts that was made out of a yellow locust also, very sturdy. And then as you see, on their preference, they'll take them One's lighter than the other. They'll take them, just put them in a the fire, heat treat them, make them a whole lot harder. There is different sizes to them, depending on the application that you wanted to shoot. You could use smaller ones for your household, you know, rats, rabbits, squirrels, something if you could hit them in your yard, just a little pest. And typically, if they was going to go hunting, they would use a longer one. And they would simply use that for if they could shoot it right. They would shoot the animal sideways, pinning it through them to the ground, and they wouldn't be able to run. Or if it was long enough, they'd shoot them straight through it. Kind of make an animal immobile on the inside, or if they went to run through the bushes, they'd get caught on the side. Then the thistles on here would be just a Scottish thistle. They'd dry those out. Once they pack these open, they roll them open, and these fuzzy thistles come out on the inside. They'd simply take them in their hand along with animal sinew, and as they'd roll it together, they'd roll the sinew up, catching the thistles, put them on there. And depending on the shooter and his application, they have different sizes of the thistles, how they very depend on how they feel like they want, you know, their application to shoot. And if I could get one of these fine young men here, I'd like for them to demonstrate what the blow gun would look like. He's like that fine young man. He's a young man. He's a young man. <laughs> He's still in his prime too. Cool. And generally, depending on the man's breath that he can gust out of it, he can get that dart to come flying out from anywhere about 50 to 65 miles an hour. And you also could get a turkey with it, but you'd have to have a direct headshot with it. That's <laughs> 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 Something with the first shot. <laughs> <laughs> and then, typically, like that, if he went to miss, he would just pull this thing out and chase it down and hit it in the head with it. 
<laughs> but this is generally something they'd carry along with them. It'd be a war club. It'd be something they'd like to use. I mean, typically we'd like to use a hand-to-hand -hand combat to fight. We felt like it was a more honorable thing. Simply to make it out of one piece of wood. They'd shave it down, leave a ball on the end of it. Very hard, sturdy on the end. Sometimes they would leave points or spears on the end of these. Or if not, they could incorporate arrowheads onto the end of these. I'm just saying you give somebody one good lick with those and you ain't having a good day. Mm. Generally, like I said, this is what we'd use as our right hand man. Something we carry along with about all times. And then like the blowgun, I mean, it would be really no use to use it on your enemy. If I was to shoot one of these guys with them, they'd just pull it out and get mad at me probably. <laughs> <laughs> Come at me with one of these. <laughs> And along with these metal rods that are laying here, that's just what we used, I mean, after the introduction of metal, it was easier to hollow out the river came with.